Welcome to Episode 6 of Ethan Sees All. Buckle up and keep your hands and feet inside the vehicle at all times, even if someone who looks like me tells you the opposite later on. Ignore him if you want to live. Enjoy! You know how the old saying goes, It takes a village to raise a child especially if that child is as tall as a skyscraper, feeds on the blood of goats, and fires gamma rays from its singular centered eyeball. Then maybe conscript a second village. Ah, what a well-worn proverb. Neighbors helping neighbors is the foundation of prosperous community life. The bond formed between those left to face the merciless elements together is one stronger than steel harder than diamond. Long before having small flying machines deliver your purchases was a luxury for more than just technical wizards, a neighbor willing to part with their surfeit of corn could mean surviving the harsh winter through. And though the winters of wherever aren't as frigid and likely to maim as they once were, the torch of rural hospitality still burns bright, even in those of us who've only recently begun to call wherever home. It must be contagious. Because when Domino, my upstairs neighbor and as of yet undiscovered rock star, wakes me with a crash against the ceiling, and then jostles me just as I'm lulling back into a dream with the high-pitched stuttering rings of a phone call, I do not spit venom through the receiver when I answer. Fumbling in the dark, I pull the wired headset to my ear. This better be good, I groan, sleepily and irritably, looking to the analog readout of my tableside clock. In black and white leaves, it reads, 5.40 a.m. Really good, I add. Hey, bud, think you could do me a favor? Domino says, and there's a pained quality to his voice. Depends on the favor, I say. Always the kidder, he laughs, but I can hear a wince beneath it. Look, I know it's your day off and all, but do you think you could run by the antique shop for me? Now, on the mile-long list of things I might have anticipated a down-on-his-luck musician to ring me up for in the wee hours of the morning, help in his search for the wardrobe that contains Narnia is... Well, it's not at the bottom. The antique shop? I ask, propping myself up on elbows, the phone gripped between my head and shoulder. Yeah, I... See, there's this... Uh, tiki totem, he says, almost embarrassedly. A tiki totem? I repeat. That sounds more like Domino. Well, two. See, I've been eyeing them for a long time. And last month, I bought one. Good for you. Thanks, brah. I put the other on hold while I got the moolah to buy his twin. But the problem is, there's been this old lady, right? She comes in every few days asking if the totem's still on hold. And it is? Yeah, until today. If I'm not there to pick it up by opening, it could end up in some biddy's garden. Next to her gnome collection. Why are you knocking gnomes? And why is it you're unable to do this yourself? One, they're hella creepy, bro. Those waxy smiles. His shudder is audible. And B, I sort of can't. He admits with the shameful tone of a puppy. You can't, I implore. I hear him fiddling with his fingers on the other side of the call. The totems were originally a pair... Uh, but this new one will be a replacement. The first one kind of fell onto my leg, and it broke. Your leg or the totem? Yes. I'm thinking it might be better off with the old lady. Though that might account for the racket this morning and the screaming. I thought you might be running a new song. It didn't sound half bad. You know. Comparatively. 
I say. Now's not the time for compliments, says Domino. They open in an hour. You in or you out? Could you please not apply cool con lingo to this glorified grave robbing, I insist. Begrudgingly, though, I relent to venture to the antique shop and seek out the matching tiki totem, despite all my highest reasoning faculties telling me to stay in bed and ignore all future calls from needy solicitors. But that wouldn't be very neighborly of me, would it? Still bleary, unsure as to exactly how I was wrangled into this agreement, I walked down the apartment stoop, past a brood of stray cats grooming, a few playfully pawing one another. The deep sea blue of the night sky prior is slowly losing its struggle for domination against swatches of a saturated pink and orange creeping along the horizon. Larks twitter buoyant songs, welcoming the morning, conjuring it into being. I try to imbue myself with a little of that positive energy as I trudge, limply, up one lane and down the next. I'm not quite by myself this dawn. The last of the snake boots stragglers go stumbling by, humming and burping and slurring jauntily, and the morning's early risers wave friendly hellos. They alone separate the dim streets from a ghost town, for very few houses or businesses I pass look as though they've entertained life in years, much less like they'll be up and at them in a few hours' time. If the steady electric buzz of the street lamps was suddenly replaced with combusting methane and its pervasive oily stench, it would complete the illusion that I've been transported into the distant past. Alas, the only time traveling I do is several minutes into the future, at the speed of one second per second. And after my expedition, I find myself looking up, with some amusement, at what, when the marquee is properly lit, probably says, Papa Zito's Antique Shop. But, with several of the bulbs blown out and blackened, looks like, Pop, a zit, Antique Shop. Pushing open the door, it strikes a tiny bell above the frame, which jingles lightly, announcing my presence. From the looks of it, the arrival of the day's first customer. Though, to be honest, it's difficult to get a good look at anything, really. Minimalism was certainly not this shopkeep's design cue. Walking in, you are met immediately by a waist-high glass enclosure, stocked to its capacity with decadent jewels and chronometers that appear to be older than time itself. Atop the enclosure sits a cash register, unmanned and likely the newest thing in the place. On either side of the cashier's case, and stretching far back into the cluttered store, there's no shortage of objects to draw the eyes. Exquisite sideboards, drawing tables, bureaus, an estimated seven chandeliers, some gas, a few electric, but each strung up from the ceiling and casting its own pale ambient glow. My feet begin to follow my gaze, deeper and deeper still. I notice the store's interior isn't spacious at all, a loop that hooks back around to the storefront, but with every nook and cranny occupied by some variegated light fixture or busty fertility statue, space seems irrelevant. I've never seen such a vast assortment of collectibles detached from time and origin. Indian elephant statues, gray, with a mossy green tarnish peeking at their crevices, neighbor model Viking ships, which both reside, anachronistically, upon a century-old upright piano from Austria, each key detuned to the same dreary thunk of loose steel wire. I'm admiring a paper lantern when I hear it. If you're here for a pus drainage, the dermatologist is two doors over, the voice calls before its owner rounds the corner into view. We have a dermatologist. 
Uh, he's more experienced with farm animal acne, but he says people aren't that far off. And you only need the one license. The old man, hunched, with a salt and pepper tuft of hair walling off his glistening bald spot, walks absentmindedly up to this trinket or that, wringing a grease-stained rag between his arthritic fingers, or using it to spit polish what is long beyond the need for a spit polish. His bare scalp is multicolored in the array of lights. That's troubling, but not why I'm here, I say. And mentally filling in the rest of the Papa Zit sign, add, You must be Papa Zito. The one and only. And oh, it's not often I see such young faces in my store. I'm afraid the hipster craze slipped us right by. I'm sorry to hear that. If I run into any beatniks, I'll send them your way. You do just that! Now what can I do you for? My first customer of the day always gets my full attention. The genial smile that spreads across his face is at once paternal and avaricious. Though I can't imagine he gets enough customers at once to ever spread that attention thin. Uh, actually... And as the words leave my mouth, my wandering gaze falls upon the wooden wingtip, and then the blocky, smirking face from which it protrudes. No sooner do I make this realization than does the bell above the door fill the small shop with yet another sharp ringing. Neither of us speaks. Small footsteps follow the sound of the door closing, a soft pitter-patter against cold travertine. They stop at the checkout counter, perhaps also noting its vacancy, and then head this way. Ah, another customer, says Zito, breaking the silence, and the woman who then rounds the corner gasps, jumping backwards. Apparently, Papa Zito is so unused to patrons, he's also unfazed when he frightens them nearly to death. The woman, around Zito's age and blue-haired, lays a hand on her rising and falling chest as she steadies herself. Mr. Zito, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, you can't sneak up on a woman with a heart this old. Can I really sneak in my own store, Gertrude? Says Zito, grinning, and Gertrude huffs, straightening out her long pleated skirt. For the first time, she seems to take note of me, and her expression grows mischievous as a pixie's. He's not here then? He's not here, so it's mine! It's mine! And I remember Domino's warning. Um, if it's the totem you're talking about, I'm... Um, I'm here for that. I mutter, with negligible confidence. Papa Zito and Gertrude both look to me, one with bewilderment, the other's face melting from a pixie's into a goblin's. No, 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 she says. You're not the dirty boy. There's a waiting list. Dirty boy and then me. Dirty boy flaked, so it's mine. Domino, uh, the dirty boy, is indisposed at the moment. I've come as proxy, I say, once again wondering how I've been talked into this predicament. Domino must be in bed, yucking it up right now. Gertrude's scowl twists and contorts, and she seethes. You can't do that! It isn't fair! He can't do that, can he? But Zito's eyes are closed, and he appears deep in thought. Well, I ask, can I do that? Zito thinks for a while, then says, Uh, as I've not drafted policies... And never having expected the antiquing market to be so competitive, there's no set recourse here. As such, there are no rules stating someone on the hold list can't have their purchase retrieved by a permitted party. Well, do you have any proof he's who he says he is? He could be trying to pry the totem from under all our noses. Gertrude tries, desperately. And the password... Domino instructed me to relay in just such a scenario, pokes its head through to my consciousness. Opening my mouth wide and positioning myself like a baseball catcher, 
I belch, the longest and most soul-quaking burp my lungs can withstand. My chest and the room rattle. It's a few seconds before the wind chimes overhanging us stop tinkling. Sounds like Domino to me, says Papa Zito. I fist pump for some reason, a lack of sleep clouding my acceptable victory center. The old woman isn't on the brink of explosion as I thought she might be, but instead looks just a little sad. All of the fire is gone out of her, and a part of me doesn't feel great about being somewhat responsible. Well, Gertrude says and chuckles grimly, I tried at least. My nephew will be happy to hear just how close we got. A light shrug of the shoulders, and she shuffles off toward the storefront. When she's left and the door clangs shut behind her, I ask Papa Zito. Her nephew? Oh yeah, kid's been head over heels with Totem since he was big enough to read about him. He doesn't live in wherever though, so whenever he comes to visit Gertrude, it's the one thing they talk about. Imagine her surprise when she spies a pair of them in here one day. Yeah, imagine that. And then your buddy goes and buys both of them. Huh. Luck of the draw, I guess. Zito laughs a hackled old man's laugh. I look to the single remaining tiki totem, standing only a few feet tall, a scaled-down version of the real deal, but still sturdily built. A goat head on a buffalo head on what almost resembles a human's head on down, and at the top, a great bird. There are bands of bright color placed here and there along the mostly solid, dark brown figure. Hey, you want that wrapped? And Zito laughs another self-indulgent laugh. When I make it back to the apartments, lugging ungainly in both arms the surprisingly hefty totem, I rested at the foot of the stoop to gather my breath and get a better handhold for the trip up the three flights of stairs to Domino's. As I'm breaking, though, Beatriz, my lower neighbor and the town's sheriff deputy, spots the totem and I on her way into the building. Viet Domino's? Mm-hmm, I muster, still a little winded. She sighs and says, Well, he'll have to wait for it. I just got back from the hospital where they're resetting his leg. Oh, geez, I say, probably sounding concerned that my friend is in a bad way, but actually accepting I'll really have to haul this up the stairs by myself. He didn't seem all that in pain when we spoke earlier, I say. Oh, after you left, he tried getting out of bed and gluing the first totem back together. How'd that pan out? His leg and the totem are in even more pieces. Yeesh. Yeesh is right. I could hear him screaming from the first floor. The boys thought he was practicing a new song. They loved it. Me? Not so much. So, maybe Domino wasn't yucking it up. Beatrice informed me he'd be under the care of physicians for a day at least, while they put his leg in a cast and remove superglued splinters from... the rest of him. I spend the better part of the next 30 minutes half carrying and half pulling the unwieldy hunk of wood to the second level, where I leave it leaning against the dresser across from my bed. It looks as out of place in my sparsely decorated room as it had back at the antique shop. Not wanting to let the day's warm weather go to waste, I pack a wicker basket of grilled cheese sandwiches, several cooked with rotting tomato and ectoplasm in the place of cheddar, a couple glass bottles of deliciously tasteless nutrient juice and a threadbare blanket and enjoy a picnic with the ghostly children of the park. When I return, hours later, basket satisfyingly light and spirits high from communing with spirits, my bed and I meet in a lover's embrace, sordid, unspeakable, and entirely too quick. My lights are out in seconds. But the two dots, now red and piercing, that make up the falcon's eyes, are just beginning to glow. Visions rattle me in my sleep. 
a restless, violent sleep, tangled in tossing among bedsheets, and seeing, in reverberant flashes across the film of my mind, recollections of a birthday party. The thick, cloying smell of buttercream, screaming children. Another flash, and I'm being led by a borzoi on a leash down a busy metropolitan sidewalk. A city's commotion fills my ears. Flashes come and go of memories, some longer than others, some formative, most depicting snapshots of the mundane, but none out of the dozens belonging to me. Infused in each foreign memory are the faintest hints of emotion. Rage, envy, love. Their echoes, breath fogging the windows of the scenery, but impossible to ignore. I feel myself, back in my bed and wherever, grimacing and smiling and tearing up at what from a bird's eye view, with my own intuition, should be perfectly innocuous everyday moments. Like a night of sleep rife with dreaming, I can't exactly recall the next morning how long these interactive slideshows went on for. But when I awake, there's light slipping in spears through the curtain lace, Unmummifying myself from the night's tumult, I look to the tiki totem. It is as I left it the previous day, still propped up directly in my eye line. Was that you? I ask the inanimate object. The inanimate object doesn't respond. Weary about keeping the thing at my bedside another night, I leave it by Domino's room before taking off for the day. It's the darndest thing, though. All afternoon at work, scanning and shelving and grappling boxes up and down shelves, a constant distraction itches at the back of my brain. I try drowning them out with the interchangeable grunge song blaring out over the store speakers, but glimpses of last night's visions appear to me as intrusive clips Disparate fragments playing and replaying until I've forgotten quite where the implanted memories begin and my own end. The workday comes to a close. I lock up the register, turn down the lights, pull closed the clanking metal shutter, and make my way, not home to the apartments, but westward. Neither my legs nor that nagging in my mind cease until I'm face to face once again with Papa Zitz. Walking through the threshold, I take in that faint mix of lemon-scented furniture polish, mold, and history with a huge whiff. Today, Papa Zito is actually at the cashier's case, on the verge of dozing off on his stool from the looks of it. The bell wakes him with a start, and he looks me over before grinning. Back so soon, are we? There's no draft in the room, but I've got the jitters nonetheless. Uh, yeah, I, I need another one, I let out. Uh, but I sold your friend that last tiki just yesterday, Zito says in mock protest. Th that's fine, I say. Anything will do, just... Give me another one. That night, as I lie in bed, I turn my head over to the dresser and the teal music box, tacked with golden embellishments that now rests upon it. Already wound and set, it plays in the gentle plinking of tiny mallets, the sweetest lullaby you've ever heard. It and the mesmerizing twirl of the miniature ballerina, forever on point, shuttle me off into the world of slumber. No peaceful slumber would this be, though. As in the night before, 
I'm once again raptured by memories not my own. But unlike that first evening, there is no struggle. I delve willingly into each life's milestone, no longer vying for freedom, but instead letting the wheel turn. It isn't like watching television, where you are viewer and viewer alone, free to observe or not at your discretion, bound only by your autonomy. Here, every movement becomes mine, was always mine. Every turn of the head, micro-gesture and thought is pre-planned and enacted, and I am but a helpless passenger to the ordeal, unable to flinch away from the ever-shifting realities. And I can't get enough. For the next day, and for weeks after, I end my shift and, like clockwork, I'm back in the antique shop, picking out pokers for the fireplace I don't have, silverware for the fancy meals I never eat, or simply chatting with old man Zito about his time in the war, which one I could never tell, and how he got into the second-hand goods race. Getting glimpses into the deepest and most personal facets of an individual's existence, their thoughts as lenses through which they construct their worldly understanding is insightful and eye-opening and, you know, great and all, but how have I gone this long without realizing how much fun antiquing is? Uncovering historical context, the bartering, the way old stuff just smells better. By George, the telltale scent of aged sandalwood is richer than any intoxicant, more aromatic and more lurid than any blossoming orchid. And I could dedicate sonnets to the elegant curves of a hand-carved decorative table leg. It's like doing business at a time traveler's gift shop. It would seem, however... My newfound love for antiquing has not gone unnoticed. On the second floor, next to the staircase, is a largely unused rec room. Guesses vary as to why, from the smell to the lack of any recreational activities, but my money is on a gang of rats, muscling everyone out of their turf. One day, though, I find a flyer taped to its door heralding a convention for those like-minded enthusiasts of the outdated to be held tonight. I haven't sat long in the rec room, empty of anything but a few hastily placed chairs and a long table by the door covered in a plastic sheet, before I come to the conclusion that this is no convention. As I connect the dots, the door to the rec room swings slowly open. In hobbles Domino on one crutch, Beatriz supporting his other arm. After a few minutes, in comes the landlord and three or so more people I can't exactly place, who must have come for the promise of free food. They all sit quietly around me, casually taking up very uncasual postures as they encircle me with their chairs. Utter silence accented occasionally by a dry cough. So, uh, I guess the convention's been postponed, I joke, attempting to break the ice, but the ice remains frozen fast. Dude, we think you have a problem, says Domino. Beatrice speaks up authoritatively. Antiquing is an addiction and it can afflict anyone. My grandmother was an antiquing addict for the last decade of her life, the landlord says, a heaviness in his voice. Was it the antiquing what did her in? asks a voice I don't know. Oh no, she was just old, but it was a real bore. Look, guys, I'm fine. I don't have a problem. I can quit any time, I insist. Really? Then you'd have absolutely no opinion on my selling this original 1955 Westman pistol. Thinking about getting a pretty hefty sum for it. Beatrice pulls the old gun, not from her holster, but from a front pocket, and turns it over in her hands. I bite my tongue, 
feeling blood trickle down my teeth. But it's no use. Oh, please! You wouldn't get more than 20 bucks and sent on your way for that obvious knockoff. My hands fly up to cover my mouth, and all too late. Mm-hmm. Let's say we get to the bottom of this little fixation, shall we? And for the next two hours, emotions are laid bare. Tears are wept, mostly dominoes as his pain meds wear off, and folk songs of togetherness are sung in three-part harmony. We all leave just a little lighter of burden than we entered, and I shake Domino Beatriz in the landlord's hands fervently, swearing to turn my life around and head down the straight and narrow of only buying things new. I tell them this with a smile on my face and in my eyes, and we all part ways and head off to our rooms for a well-earned night of sleep. Well, they do. I, on the other hand, tiptoe furtively down the second floor staircase, silently past the first floor bedrooms, and down the stoop to the dark street below. I can quit whenever I want, and I'll do it tomorrow. Today, however, there's a sale. You don't know love until you've found a trio of matching vulture lamps. Discounted! Love may desert you. The vultures never will. It is darker now than my first trip to the antique shop, but I've been so often by now, I know the way by heart. Good thing, too, because closing is in less than an hour, and Baby needs his scavengers. In and out of rings of street lamp light, like driving through a tunnel, and I'm at Papa Zito's little store. He's nowhere to be seen when I step up to the counter, though, and neither are the vulture triplets who were perched menacingly in the window just yesterday. Disappointed, I'm just about to head out, when something in the jewelry case sparkles against the backlight. The enclosure is usually dark during the day, so I hadn't paid it any attention before. But inside... Between the rows of hand-me-down diamonds and sapphires and blazing rubies, there is a rose-gold pocket watch, cradled delicately in its folded chain. Oh, it's you, Ethan! And Zito appears, rag in hand, wiping away black oil from his palm. Thought I heard the bell ring. If you're here for the bird lamps, I sold them earlier to a sweet young man and his mother. Finding it difficult to shake my focus from the timepiece, I shake my head instead. I saw that, I say. But no, I... I'm wondering about this pocket watch. What's the wonder? It's yours, says Zito. I'm taken aback. Huh? For a price, that is! And Zito laughs a choking laugh. I pay the price and go on my way through the wherever dusk, revolving the cold metal watch around and around in the satin carrying bag Zito included with purchase. Back at the apartments, I make little effort to disguise the sound of my footfalls. I'm too preoccupied with what's in my hands. The prickly sort of excitement one gets on the night before an important event courses my spine. It isn't long, however, before I've laid the watch down with care on my dresser and am settled under a small hill of blankets and have begun to doze off. I'm once again careering through a tunnel, but this time the tunnel is very real and it surrounds me on all sides in a swirling mixture of blinding light, color, and sound. Only, I'm not being surrounded, as I have no physical form. I'm one with the tube of unimaginable wonder. I'm sliding down and up and holding perfectly still in this high-speed collision of the senses. Suddenly, everything goes white. And 
and I'm a child. A young girl of no more than seven on hands and knees in a sandbox, shovel in hand, and a tenacity with each blow of the plastic spade against dirt. I've two filthy spots on my dress where I've been kneeling in mud, but I don't care. I'm nearing the center of the earth. Who cares about a soiled dress? There is an intense flash of light, and I'm no longer in the sandbox. I'm standing on a stage behind a lectern Amidst the whirring and bright flashbulbs of cameras, the click of shutters firing rapidly, I'm presenting something, giving a speech perhaps, accepting an award. I'm a few years older, but I appear to be the youngest person present. I can't hear a word I'm saying. One more flash of a camera. The flash of the world changing about me. And I'm once again on my knees, not in the rounded, loose sediment of a child's sandbox, but on hard-packed, dusty earth. The sun overhead is an angry orange speck, heating the ground and our tools and our bodies to uncomfortable temperatures. But still, my team and I dig. We are uniformed in khakis, which show few stains and provide modest protection from the sun's brutal waves. I wipe my brow and strain my neck backward to see the point of the massive pyramid above me. Once we find this entrance, I look to the glare of that unforgiving sun, and a flash fills my vision. I can't tell where I am now. I'm sitting upright, in a bed, and staring straight out through the window ahead, out onto the tops of trees that stretch as far as the eye can see. There's a quiet to this memory that the others lacked. No vague emotional pull. It's almost enough to make me lucid. But without looking down, my hand takes hold of a chain around my neck, the fingers trailing down until they tap the circular face of the rose gold pocket watch. I run my thumb over the engraved back, smiling as a little hand grasps at my thumb. I gaze lovingly down at the stubby little fingers attached to the chubby little arms that bob up and down trying to reach the shiny plaything. The baby lying happily in my lap coos and giggles as I run my fingers through his already lush head of bright red fluff. A voice speaks. My voice, I realize. Rather, the voice of the person I'm currently inhabiting. My father gave this watch to me when I was a girl. And one day, it'll make its way back to you. I tickle the baby's tummy, producing more adorable squeals. Wouldn't you like that, Ethan? And a powerful strobe of light rips the scene away. The next day, for reasons I can't quite articulate, my fascination with antiquing all but died off. I returned some of the things I bought, the ones I couldn't in good conscience give away, but I still visit Zito from time to time, who is just happy to have someone to test out his bad jokes on. After telling him about Gertrude's nephew and his nigh-obsessive love for tiki totems, Domino felt a pang of guilt or really bad indigestion, 
and decided to give his prized possession, one of which he'd already smashed, to someone who'd truly cherish it forever, or until it started to give them the memories of its former owners in mind-rending involuntary spasms, but maybe that's why he likes totems. Who am I to rock the boat? I did, however, keep the pocket watch. Ah, uh, but what am I telling you for? I'm sure you've choked on dust in an antique shop in a town just like this one. It's all the same. Here, there, wherever. On a serious note, I'd like to sit down and talk to you all about the very real dangers of antiquing addiction. I know we make a bit of a joke of it on today's episode, but double A is no laughing matter. Have you noticed your friends collecting more bronze statues of lions recently? Do their walls feature a disconcerting amount of cuckoo clocks? Do they own more than one set of china out of which they refuse to let anyone drink or eat? If you or anyone you know answered yes to any of the above symptoms, it's all right. The first step to recovery is acknowledging you have a problem. The next step is giving me all of the cuckoo clocks to... Dispose of. Yes, that's right. To dispose of. This has been a PSA.